Michael Fields, executive director of Colorado Rising Action, in which he explains that education spending is up, but teacher pay is actually down. Michael Fields, good morning. Welcome back to Business for Breakfast. Good morning, Jimmy. It's good to be back on with you. Great to have you on the program. So let's just start with the big picture here. What does the data show about rising education spending and decreases in spending on teachers? Yeah, so the Fordham Institute did a study uh, that went back to 1990, and they did it across the country, uh, but I obviously zeroed in on what was going on in Colorado. And basically the gist of it is uh, since 1990, education spending adjusted for inflation has gone up 20%. Uh, teacher pay at during that same time has gone down 20%. So we are putting more and more dollars into our education system and less money is getting to teachers. So they did it by salary and said we have uh, the average teacher gets paid $47,000 a year. If it would have kept pace uh, with what we were spending in 1990, it would be at $70,000. So that you know leads to the question of where is this money going? And I think it's something that uh, legislators at district need to look into. Um, some of this health care costs, uh, obviously our, our pension system, uh, you know, has problems and more and more money goes there. Um, but, you know, there's administration costs. Um, there's all kinds of things that need to be looked into because teachers should get paid more uh, and the dollars are there to do it. Now, I just want to put this in perspective. I was born in 1990. And so we have seen growing spending on K-12 through education here in Colorado and at the same time decline in what teachers should be earning here in this great state throughout my the course of my lifetime and that is just staggering to think about okay let's talk about this administration concept because that's what it seems to be michael fields is that the money is not being allocated into the classroom where it belongs and i've talked with educators who have told me who are in lower income school districts that they even have to spend their own money to buy tissues in the classroom in order for their kids to not be you know picking their nose or whatever yeah, administration costs, um, and we've seen this over the last decade. We have numbers for, and uh, teachers have gone up 8%, administrators have gone up 35%, um, and only 53% of the dollars that we spend on education get to instruction, uh, get to the classroom. And so, and that's down. I mean, if you look, you know, years years ago, a decade ago, it was close to 60%. Now it's 53 We're moving in the wrong direction uh, at a time when the people want, teachers to get paid more. They want money to get into the classroom. There was a Magellan strategy poll just yesterday that came out that said 74% of voters want teachers to get paid more. Uh, but that same poll said that a majority of people think that districts aren't using the money most effectively. So I think there, there needs to be more transparency on this. Uh, there was you know a few stories last year about Denver public schools specifically and how many administrators they have uh, and how it's far above the state average. But I think it's a discussion that we need to have if we're going to have this discussion about underfunding in schools or tax increases or those things you were talking about, bond increases. We have to start, where's the money going? And if we put more money into that system, where will it go? And if history shows us, uh, it's not going to go to teachers. Uh, let me ask you this question here, Michael Fields. In terms of the allocation of spending and what, what's going on as far as administration, when we talk about administration that's getting all these dollars, what what are the growing positions? I mean, well, what are the people actually doing? What are the roles? Well, it depends on the district, obviously. It depends on the school. But, uh, you know, we have more assistant principals, more people recruiting. Uh, you know, and, and it's one of the, the problems that you have in, in a lot of these areas, too, is when you have a low teacher pay, it's harder to get them. So you need more people out trying to get and find teachers. Um, you have more support staff and uh, deans and uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, but you look at especially these districts with big central offices, you know, uh, DPS has their big central office downtown. Um, and, you know, they were after this, the teacher strike were forced to, to cut a lot of people from there. Um, but the problem that we have with our education system, when we, we send the money to the district, they decide what they want to take care of and then send the money to the schools or the classrooms after that. Um, you know, I think there needs to be some kind of talk of reform saying, how do we take care of our, our schools first, our teachers first, and then, you know, that, the, the money that needs to happen and gets kicked back up to administration. Uh, we just have it kind of reversed right now. And so these big districts, APS, DPS, 
uh, especially are very top heavy. I think, Michael, that one of the reasons why we've seen this growth in administrative costs and administrative positions has been in large part because of the need to comply with a burdensome federal government that's trying increasingly to micromanage local communities and how they are conducting education and, and states like Colorado and how they want to set policy. Because when you have the federal government make mandates, they have all sorts of different criteria, things you have to meet, and then you have to demonstrate to them that you're actually meeting those criteria in order to get more federal funding, and the list goes on and on. And so to some extent, it's almost no wonder that you have some of the growth in administrative costs and administrative positions because of an overzealous federal government, which underscores the need maybe to scale back the role of the Federal Department of Education. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, we have had more regulations, uh, piled on regulations uh, for years now. You know, it goes through ton, you know, through many presidents, uh, many administrations that this has been going on. I think it's a great point that it takes more administrators to fill out the paperwork, to, you know, oversee certain things. It also puts a lot more pressure on teachers, so they're getting paid less and asked to do more during that time. Um, you know, it, it's no wonder that a, a lot of them end up leaving or, or not getting into it to start with and add on, you know, student debt and how much you have to pay. Uh, for that, uh, you know, it, it's a it's a tough profession, but I think it's a healthy discussion for us to have. I don't think it's a simple solution of we just need to raise taxes and it'll fix the system. I think we need to change our funding formula. We need to have these conversations within each district. Uh, but yeah, I think you're right. The, the more regulations and uh, you know burdensome. That stuff that comes from the federal government, uh, the harder it is for the system. Talking with Michael Fields, Executive Director of Colorado Rising Action, one thing that I think is, is and I've alluded to this in regards to tissues before, is just so stunning to me is how many teachers have to buy supplies for their classroom. We're talking basic supplies for their own classroom, in part because of the misdirection of funds that you're not having them go into the classroom nearly as much as they should be. And so one thing that you would think might actually be helpful is, well, let's at least provide a tax credit, an expansive tax credit for educators that actually are finding themselves needing to buy more supplies for their classroom. There was a bill to actually do that in this legislative mm -hmm. session that was killed by the Democrats. Yeah, uh, Owen Hill ran a bill. Uh, they actually killed two bills that I think would have helped teachers uh, this year, but that was one of them. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's something that it's kind of baffling because it's like if, uh, you know, these legislators say that they want to go, they go to these rallies, they say they support teachers, uh, and then a bill like that comes up and says, we want to give you a tax credit if you are using uh, this money, which I think, you know, it shouldn't be the case. Uh, we have enough money in our system to cover the tissues and, and you know, pencils that, that people need in the classroom. Uh, but the ones that are doing it, and it is happening, should get a tax credit. Uh, the Democrats shot that down. They also shot down a bill uh, that would have give uh, a highly effective teachers a $2,000 bonus, which is almost half of our teachers here in Colorado are rated highly effective. Um, and Paul Lundin wrote, uh, you know, ran that bill. Uh, and the Democrats shot it down, basically saying, we just want more money into the system in general. We don't want to uh, do these small things that, that actually would help teachers and that teachers were excited about. Uh, so that was disappointing to see. Now, let's talk about this notion of how teacher performance is assessed here in the state. You talk about the idea of paying high-performing teachers a bonus, $2,000 at least was proposed in uh, Lundin's bill that did not pass, and about f half of the teachers in the state perform qualify as high-performing teachers. How is that determined, Michael Fields? So you have a system uh, after SB 191, uh, which passed in 2010. It was uh, Mike Johnson's uh, big bill. But basically, it made it so that we have a, a standardized test that uh, all of our students here in Colorado take once a year. Um, and that makes up half of the teacher's evaluation. Uh, the other half comes from the school administrator, so a principal or assistant principal that goes into the classroom that deals with the teacher, has them kind of do self-evaluations, has the, the evaluation from the, the principal or assistant principal, and that makes up the other half of that system. And so, um, you know, there's been pushback. There was a, a, some bills this year trying to say uh, the standardized test should be less of an amount uh, or, you know, not at all. Um, and so that's been a, a topic of discussion since 2010, but that's basically half, uh, you know, your growth on a, on a, on a standardized test and then half, uh, you know, that assessment from the administrator. 
Okay, let's dive into that topic of standardized tests a little bit and how weight, heavily weighted they are on determining teacher performance and also funding for schools as well, because you and I disagree, at least on some level in this regard, in that I think uh, very dubiously and in many respects negatively about the notion of standardized tests, how they function, how they operate, and the significant role that they play in making these determinations. What's your take on standardized testing? Well, I think that they're, um, I think one, the kids are tested too, tested too much. Um, you know, there's this one standardized test, but, uh, most schools have mul- you know, multiple tests through the year, assessments all the time. Uh, I think we, we test too much, and I think Colorado, you know, voters, uh, in their polling agree with that. Um, I also think, though, that it's, it, it's not a perfect system to have standardized tests. It's far from it. Uh, but it's the best system, uh, just because we have to know if kids are learning or not. And the only way that we know that is comparing them to other kids, uh, you know, in other parts of the state on a, on a test. Now, could a test be better? I think that's a conversation we could have. Um, but I think there has to be some kind of standardized test to know our kids in Pueblo in that eighth grade class learning, uh, and, you know, compared to kids in, in Denver or, or Fort Collins or wherever. Um, and my personal experience is being a former teacher, being uh, somebody who's on the board of a charter school here, uh, is that teachers, good teachers, uh, tend to over time do well on the standardized test. The kids do well on the standardized test. You walk into the classroom, they're disciplined, they're learning, you can see that, and then the tests come back and it, it reaffirms what you see in the classroom. Um, yeah, one year, you know, sometimes it might not be exactly right, but, you know, somebody who's there 10 years, you know, eight or nine of those years are going to have really solid test scores. So I think, um, you know, it's not a perfect system, but but I think it's, it's one that we have to have in place. Here are a couple of the, the challenges that I have with standardized testing being a component of the classroom, at least to such a heavy extent as we've got it. First of all, there really is a, a circumstance of teaching to the test. I mean, I have talked with, uh, you know, been in many fifth grade classrooms talking about the constant Constitution and American government, and I know that mm-hmm. civics education is uh, not taught as often as it really should be, not fully uh, accentuating uh, an aspect of the curriculum for fifth grade, just as one example that is critical, yeah. in large part because teachers are needing to focus on the standardized testing components because a lot of the funding and also their performance themselves is heavily weighted in that direction. And so I've talked with teachers who said they spend precious little time on civic education in the classroom because they're having to focus much more on math and science and certain things that are very important for sure but to a, and per, but particularly doing that in a way that they think will particularly fit with what's going to be on the testing but then also when the kids sit down on their at their computer screens and they're taking the standardized test because that's how they do it now if they have a, an issue with the computer itself the teachers basically cannot help those kids which certainly emphasizes more stress for the students it becomes more difficult for them to be able to complete the test and then those teachers are then graded on something that they have very little control over i think that if if you're going to do standardized testing it needs to be done much better than it is well i think those are good points um i think you know we are moving towards um you know doing this solely on the computer but for the last few years and at the school that i'm at we decided to do paper uh tests and we were allowed to do that uh, for that reason that kids, you know, aren't always in front of a computer, know how to use it uh, to the degree that, you know, we feel comfortable um, and we're moving towards computer ones. But I think that's something that needs to be trained by the teacher, um, you know, by the school. We are in, a, in an age where, there, you know, technology is used for a lot of things. Uh, I think your civics point is really a good one. Um, if a school is ignoring uh, civics or, you know, certain science things or whatever because of, of a test that's not a good thing, and I think they need to fill that in. If we're doing reading, we're going to read, uh, you know, and try to improve our reading. We're going to do that based on some of the civic stuff. Obviously, there are tests, um, you know, certain years for science, certain years for social studies, but I think those are things that could be worked out within a system. Uh, my concern is that you have kids sitting in a classroom uh, for years that are never really assessed on can they, can they read, can they do basic math, and we don't know that. Uh, I think that's something, if we're putting this much money into it, on the district level, at the state level, I think there has to be some kind of standard that knows, hey, kids, kids are, are at least at this level. Um, and I think to your point, you know, I think we could improve that system, uh, but, but I think we have to have it. 
Yeah, the, the other thing is the, the amount of stress that gets placed on kids at oftentimes at, at this point. And then also when you look at in some of the ways that the funding is allocated, if you have low performing schools because of the expense um, or rather because of the funding and that they don't have as much resources and they're in an impoverished community, let's say down in, in Pueblo, for example, in some of those areas where you have more impoverished community, where you have a cycling of students that come in and out of the, of this classroom and maybe showing up mid-year into the classroom. I, mean, I was talking with a, with a teacher in that exact type of situation last month uh, about this, that you, know, you get more funding in some ways at some points because you are lower income school, but then you, you find yourself in, in a difficult position as far as if you actually improve the quality of the education there, then your funding from the federal government might yep. go down. And you have just the, the whole way I think needs to be reevaluated. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, we do want to give more uh, resources to, uh, you know, schools that might need it for, you know, they have a lot of students that come in behind, you know, there might be two grade levels behind in reading or something. We want to get more resources there. But if you're successful, uh, those resources shouldn't be taken away from you. Um, you know, you should be rewarded in some way for doing a good job. So I think, yeah, there's definitely there's flaws in the system. And part of that is because we have so much involvement from the federal government, so much involvement from the state, uh, and then, you know, localities were a local control state, but, uh, you know, a lot of local control isn't there because funding is coming from these other sources. So yeah. I think there needs to be a lot flushed out within this system. Uh, I don't disagree with that. I just, I do think we need accountability uh, to make sure that the kids are learning. That's the point of education is our kids are, are our kids learning in the classroom. And I think we can argue over the details of it. Um, but I think, you know, one thing we were talking about earlier is that we need to, to make sure that we have good teachers in classrooms. And part of that is making sure that the money's getting to them and getting to, to these students. Um, and then we can talk about, you know, what kind of standardized tests could be better, what kind of funding mechanisms could be better. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that any f f sort of standardized test I isn't uh, appropriate at certain mm -hmm. points, maybe in a K-12 through education experience, or that there shouldn't be some role at times for for that in, in the equation of determining funding. I just think that the way that it's structured, how heavily weighted the standardized testing is, and also so how much time has to be devoted to that needs to be reevaluated. But one thing I'm very curious about, when we talk about increasing teacher pay and that sort of thing, I mean, we're discussing a lot of things that need to be done at a district level in terms of reevaluating administration and so forth, but largely, you know, a lot of that influenced by the federal government and all the regulations, red tape, that local communities have to comply with requiring new people that can fill out the paperwork and everything. But when you have legislation, like Owen Hill's bill to put forward this idea of allowing teachers a tax credit to for, for out-of-pocket expenses, which they're doing all yep. the time, hundreds of dollars at least a year uh, teachers doing in, in terms of that, or Paul Lundeen and his bill to pay a yep. bonus to high-performing teachers. Why do the Democrats kill something like those two things? I think because they want, you know, they want a bigger piece of the pie. They want to pass something like Amendment 73, and they say, you know what, we're not going to take any of this low-hanging fruit that will actually help teachers. Uh, I think teachers need to know this, that these bills were out there, that there's more of them, that the Democrats didn't put forward one bill that would practically help teacher pay this session. Um, I think, you know, they're really just saying we want to go all in on a big tax increase, and we're not going to take anything less than that. And I think that's a mistake. I think teachers should should have that discussion with the union and with the Democrats and say, look, we care about this $2,000 this year. Um, we want this right now, and we can have a, a larger discussion about other things. But um, I think there should be a backlash towards that because that's just not good legislation. That's not, you know, in the best interest of students, given the fact that no tax increase has been close lately. Like, this isn't, a, you know, like, hey, just next year we'll get this. Like, they're not going to pass a billion dollar plus tax increase and they've the last six you know tax increases have lost at the ballot why don't we go after those smaller things that really practically help teachers so i was disappointed to see that this year
Yeah, I think there's very strong points about that is you do what focus a little bit more on what's practical, what's achievable, what the yeah. people of Colorado will actually support, which is, yes, paying teachers more, but doing so in a way that makes fiscal sense and also is allocating funds appropriately into the classroom and paying teachers more the way that they, they should be getting paid more. Michael Fields of Colorado Rising Action. Final question. Do you think the tide is going to start turning as far as Coloradans insisting upon a better allocation of resources in, in our K-12 through system? I think it's inevitable because of the rejection of these tax increases. Um, I think there has to be that discussion, and we're going to try to keep pushing this information out there uh, so that districts have the discussion, that teachers are aware of this. So I think I think there could be movement. I think stats really are, are glaring. The people, you know, when people see it, they're like, oh, my goodness, I didn't know it was that bad. So I think getting this information out there is important. Michael Fields, again, Executive Director of Colorado Rising Action. Great conversation, great piece for the Gazette. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me on, Jimmy. All right, that is it.